action. Hi everybody! Welcome back to uh, another episode of All Talk with me. My name is Mike All. Thanks so much for uh, hopping on and watching. I uh, got a very funny guy. My first uh, comedian. I'm happy to have that is not from Chicago. Uh, very funny guy. Um, <laughs> he is a Michigan guy uh, from Grand Rapids. Very funny. Uh, his debut album was His Name Is My Name Too. Uh, he runs the Deggy Draft, which I'm really interested to get into that a little bit. Uh, he does some really great characters on his YouTube channel uh, and a bunch of other stuff, some sketch comedy stuff. Uh, he's very funny uh, on stage by himself and with other people. Please say hi to Adam Deggy. What's going on, Adam? Hey, I, I just want to start by apologizing that I'm not uh, from Chicago. <laughs> it's, I wish it's that I was. <laughs> yeah, well, you come through and perform every now and then. You were at the comedy bar here uh, not too long. Or like yeah, I did year, the right? comedy. I had on the comedy bar last May, actually. Okay. It's been like yeah. a year, but um, uh, yeah, I, I I wish that I would have started in a bigger city, and it would be nice to have you know real sports franchises to cheer for outside of the Red Wings. So. <laughs> well, I know. So it's funny. Like I um, so I'm originally from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually, uh, long story short, parents got divorced. And my dad ended up in Midland, Michigan, which uh, they're under a little bit of water, to say the least, right now. Yeah. Um, but my dad made that move up to Michigan uh, in the late 80s when I was a diehard Oklahoma State slash Barry Sanders fan. Mm. So I grew up a diehard Lions fan, still am a diehard Lions fan. and. Uh, a Red Wings fan because I, that's how I was lucky enough. That's who introduced me to hockey was the Red Wings. Awesome. I got I got at least lucky with the Red Wings. <laughs> yeah, man, they they were the franchise for a long, long time. Yeah, it's been kind of rough watching them go downhill. Some um, it all started when they went to the East, and mm -hmm. I understand why they went to the East. It makes sense, uh, but it, it's it's been kind of rough lately. Uh, so, but the, the Griffins are pretty good there in the Grand Rapids. That's where you're at. Griffins have been really good. Yeah. Um, man, I, I don't know when they, the last time they won their cup, maybe it's, it's been two or three years, I think, but, um, yeah, they've sent a lot of guys up to the, to the wings, obviously. Yeah. And it's cool to have the IHL hockey here in town. Those games are a lot of fun. They usually have like a, I think that for a while they had like a dollar beer night, which was almost too cheap, but it's like, it was like the beer where you drank three or four drafts and you had a headache, like right. <laughs> terrible, terrible keg beer. But um, it was always fun. Just the, the hockey atmosphere is so much different from a diff any other sporting event. So it's, it's a ton of fun. Yeah, it's funny. I compare it to soccer a lot of the time because it's that same kind of pace with not a lot of uh -huh. breaks in it. Um, and the hockey fans can be as crazy as soccer fans. Like, oh, yeah, they can. <laughs> they can be pretty fucking nuts. So I, um, I, I, I think, ah, man, I want to say hockey fans, too, are they're maybe more passionate and more, you know, loyal than – the other fan bases you know depending on the franchise but hockey fans seem to be you don't see you don't see a lot of flip-flopping in hockey fans or and maybe yeah. i'm wrong but like I, there's not a lot of guys who are ho just randomly hockey fans of like the the team that's good this year you know but right the bandwagon fans right yeah you definitely get that with football you definitely get that with baseball and basketball, basketball you get yeah. it with the, you, you get it with the big three for sure mm -hmm. so um, you know, we'll, uh, I definitely want to continue talking sports with you for sure, but I want to get uh, a couple of things, uh, a couple of questions about you out of the way. You do a lot of sketch comedy. Did you start in the sketch stuff or did you start? No, I, I mean, I, I've of... always been, you know, a, a stand up guy first, but, you know, being in a smaller market, 
in the Midwest um, that's not as big as, as a Chicago or one of the coasts, whether you're in LA or New York, I, I think I knew early on before YouTube and social media uh, got bigger that I was going to have to try to do something to, you know, just have another outlet to, you know, get my name out there and, and just have another outlet for comedy in general, because there's some things that you can do in a sketch that you couldn't do in stand up. You know, I'm, I'm sure you thought of a bit and it didn't really work on stage or you couldn't really figure out how to make it work on stage, but you thought maybe this could work better as a sketch or in a sitcom, that kind of thing. So, um, and I, I've always just had characters and did silly things with friends uh, before I even did stand up. So I think I just kind of out of, boredom and wanting to do something other than stand up to you know itch that that yeah. you know funny bone or whatever the phrase is uh i i right <laughs> i found it you know in in that capacity so but the the thing about it is man is a lot of a lot of comics at least like the guys who are that call themselves the purists it's kind of frowned upon yeah like the 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 whole not necessarily sketch, but character specifically, especially if you're like, you're trying to have success on YouTube for whatever reason, a lot of comics aren't, uh, aren't into that. But I think that'll change because it's, it's becoming more and more important, I think, to have another platform and to have uh, not necessarily a following, but to just have content elsewhere, whether it's a podcaster like what we're doing right now or a YouTube channel with characters and sketch and all that stuff. So do you, when, when you're doing a lot of those characters and a lot of that stuff that you're putting out, are you writing that? Are you pre-writing that? Or do um, you, or to be you, honest, man, a lot that? of that stuff I go in with, like, I know the character, the gist of the character. What does he sound like? What is this guy's, you know, ridiculous yeah. backstory? And um, not a very detailed backstory, but just like, <laughs> oh, this guy, sure. this guy's a boxer who refuses to take his boxing gloves off. And now he can't do anything around the house because he can't fucking <laughs> grab anything. <laughs> um, st stupid stuff like that. But, you know, so much of the dialogue is just like really just me winging it with yeah. whoever's recording and just having fun with it. Because, you know, you can always just record it again and you know i'm doing it for myself it's not like there's a uh somebody funding me and it's there's no time constraints or anything like that so do you, i have fun with it do you do your i have a two-part question for you do you do your stand-up in the same way in the sense do you write it out or do you have an idea of what you're you're going to do when you go on stage and then if if not are you a are you a writer? Do, like, do you like to write it out or do you like to no, just go I, up? You and... know, I'm not a, what you would call a writer. And to be honest, it's mostly just out of uh, laziness, um, which I'm ashamed to say, but <laughs> I, I've, I've done comedy long enough that I, and I don't even think I'm a guy who writes nearly as much as he should, but mm -hmm when you've done comedy for, you know, almost 15 years, I, I've got enough material now that I, a lot of times I just get on stage and I, I, I do my act. Like, I don't remember the last time I did, I had lined a club and, and I had like a 45 minute set prepared. I'll know what I'm going to do first. And I know what I'm going to close with, but everything in between, I kind of let the audience take me where I'm going. Um, which is probably a detriment to my act and my career, if I'm being honest. I should be a lot more <laughs> yeah. focused on being organized and having a, a plan from beginning to end and then, you know, just doing it. And yeah. uh, I, I, sh I should be a lot, a lot more organized and more disciplined in, in, in that way. But I don't know, man. I just, I have so much fun, I think, doing crowd work and messing with the audience and just kind of going all over the place that uh, I haven't fell in, fell into to those. Yeah, <laughs> those norms. Well, I, I, I think, uh, I think uh, I've only, 
I've only uh, I've only seen you a handful of times. Like I've seen you a couple of times at Laugh Fest when I was just mm -hmm. I was there on another show and came through. And then I I, I saw you most recently. I think it was back in January at uh, uh, what was that Sunday Night Funnies. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I the thing that I saw that I liked about you that that was entertaining to watch you is you like I saw you look at your note. Because the Sunday Night Funnies is basically a mic, a, 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 right. a, a, an over, a, a well-produced mic. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember you said something. You said like this throw throwaway line, and someone in the audience replied to it, and then you spent the next six minutes <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah, and it was great. You know, it was great. And then it was like, and then you had like two minutes left and you were just like, I'm done. And then you went back and kind of wrote down a little bit of like that conversation yeah. that you had on the stage. Um, is that typically how it comes to you? Um, not every time. I, I mean, I'm definitely a lot looser and a lot, a lot more likely to do that during an open mic with an open mic set, which again is probably hurts me more than it helps me because, you know, even if I do crowd work, and somebody hackles or says something that brings me in a certain direction and I get laughs out of it. Um, I feel like I've already, I feel like I had that skill when I started and, I, and I've already like developed it where it, it's almost a waste of that stage time when I should be up there working on new material and a premise and like, you know, becoming comfortable with, with new stuff and, and getting sharper that way rather than just go off on a tangent and mess with whoever and, and do crowd work. And, and to be honest with you, it's, it's more of just having ADD and like not being able to focus yeah. <laughs> as long as I should. But. but when you have something like that in that situation, when you walk off the stage and everybody was into it and had a good time and laughed, in that moment, do you feel like you had a good set and you're happy with what you did? Yeah, or I mean, are you, it, or are you more upset that like you didn't work on what you wanted to work on? You know, I'd be lying if I said like if I if I really felt like I got the best of a of a heckler, and I haven't had a ton of like heckling situations where I've felt threatened or the guy was really being that big of a dick sure. or or a woman was really being that big of a bitch. You know, whatever the case may be, it's it's always more playful. I like to you know keep the vibe like that but um i mean i guess i i can always take things that were you know that i came up with off the top of my head and off the cuff that i can turn into material or use in the future with a hackler or in a similar situation so i guess you can take things from it but I, the things i know i need to work on are being more disciplined with just doing my new stuff and and yeah. you have to become more comfortable with bombing than you are with doing proven things or, or doing crowd or, or what you know will work it's so much of it is just swallowing pride and I, and I still have to work on it 15 yeah. years in because I'll, I'll do a mic and some comic will go be for me and crush whether he's doing material or he's doing crowd work. And then I'm like, oh, in my head, I'm, you know, my pride tell me, well, you can't bomb now. You, you've got to just right. do what works <laughs> when it's, I, you, you shouldn't do that. You know, if you want to be, become a better comic, you should do your new stuff and, and, and really get that down and, and perfect it. And I, I think that's another one of my problems is I'm satisfied with things too quick when I could get more out of them or make them even better. So. Yeah, it's so, always a learning process, I, man. Right. Yeah. I, I think one of the hardest things for me that I wish I could do is I record audio, audio record mm -hmm. at every yeah. set I do. Um, I listen to zero of them. I, yeah, I can't get myself <laughs> to go back and listen. To I'm it. the same way. I'll record it almost just so I have, because I'll, I'll, I'll turn the recorder on. And not only is it recording, but then I know how long I've been on stage. And, right. <laughs> um, but I can, I can barely listen to myself, let alone, I know there's guys who will, you know, get video of their every set and they'll go back and watch it. And I just, I hate, I hate yes. like anything I repeat. I, I hate it. Anything 
even my mannerisms, I use my hands too much. And, and right. but that's how you get better. I should be watching. I should hate <laughs> that I do those things. So I should stop doing them. But I, oh man, I can't bring myself to do it, which is. I can't, I can't bring myself to do it. Like, even like if I had a good set in my mind, mm -hmm. I definitely will not go back and listen or watch to that because then if like there's no laughing in the recording, I'm like, what the fuck? No, I thought that was, you know, right. and then it's, I'm like, so I'm like, yeah. But I mean, I, you know, we're talking about the, the, this is honestly, this is what separates, I think, successful comedians from not successful, you know, regardless of the talent you have. Cause I mean, let's, let's be honest. There's comics with less talent who have more success than tons of comics with more talent. And sure. I mean, it's, it's just like any other profession. It's, the guys that are doing the things that aren't fun more, those are probably the, the people right. that are having more success. So, and I just haven't, I, I love this so much and, and I have so much fun doing it, but I, I, I still, I, like, I still need to write more and critique my sets more. There's so much I could be doing yeah. to become a better comic that I don't. And yeah, one of the it's things frustrating. Yeah, kind of along those lines is one of the things uh, I read uh, an interview that you did with uh, Review Magazine back oh, in February of 2014. Yeah, it's been a minute. And as we sit here talking with you, sitting in your house in Grand Rapids, one of the things that they had asked you what, where you thought yourself would be sooner than later, oh, God. your answer was New York or L.A. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, dude. Did, did either of those ever come? Now, I know like Jacob, uh, who's hilarious, uh, he, is he still out in LA? I know he made the jump out there. He, he is, yeah. Back or he's still out he's there. He's out there, but he, you know, I love that guy, but he, he's, he's got a pretty good job and he, he's super talented with like graphic design and, and he's got his oh, okay. closing line and, and a podcast. And for him, I, I think stand up was more of just an outlet to, show people how weird he is and, and to just, yeah. you know, do some form of comedy. And, and I think he still likes it, but he, he doesn't do it very often anymore. And I, I know a lot of guys who have moved out to LA and they kind of, they get a good job and they're paying their rent and they fall into, you know, just another life where they're not doing it as much anymore. But it, at the same time, I, I can't blame him because it's so hard to get stage time and you're right. essentially starting from scratch and, any traction you had here is lost. But if I'm being honest, what happened with me, Mike, is I met my wife and yeah. <laughs> we got married and my wife is pretty family oriented. And I, you know, and it's, it's nothing against her, but I, I don't know that my wife would be willing to move to one of the coasts unless I already had an opportunity set up for myself, like at 36, sure. And she's in her, she's getting older for, for me to expect her to like pack up and move so I can pursue my dream where she's already supportive here just on a whim. Um, That's tough. At, at this stage, it'd be really difficult for me to convince her to do that. And I wouldn't expect her to. So, um, and, and yeah, to be tough. honest, man, I think the but, dream is for me, at least if you can, like, there's a ton of people in New York and LA who don't want to be there. They're just there because that's what they were told they're supposed to do. And that's where they thought they were supposed to go. But I feel like if, if you knew you could have the same success from your home base, I think a lot of people would have, would have stayed, you know, depending on where they're from. Now, if I grew up and if I was still in like Muskegon or something, then from think it from somebody from Oklahoma. Like I, I, I love Oklahoma. I got <laughs> friends and family there. So like, I understand where you're coming from too. Like, um, for, for a long time, I tried to blame my wife for you right. know, me not having some of the, because like I met my, my wife, I met my girlfriend in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. She moved to Denver. I didn't want to go to Denver, but God damn it, I loved her. So, you know, we actually broke up and then I moved out to Denver and I had great comedy going in Denver. And then she got into school out in Chicago. So I moved out into Chicago and I tried to blame her for a long time of like, it's her fault that we keep moving. But after a lot of deep thought, I'm like, oh, I made those choices. Yeah. You know, like 
I I made those choices to go and and do those. And I I'm mean, glad that I did. You know, I've got a great wife. I've got a great family, and I ended up in Chicago, right. which is a fantastic place to live, and it's a good place for comedy. Yeah, but. and I, if we're being honest, man. If I wanted to be, if I really wanted to be either one of those places, yeah. I'd be there. I I yeah. would have moved. I would have moved when I was in my early twenties, and I you know there was nothing here holding me back. I, I mean, I would have gone. Yeah. Um, and, and so much of it is just the unknown. I mean, but I'm not ashamed to say like I, I was probably afraid of letting everything go that I, I was, you know, accomplished yeah. here and, and all the, the work on the road I am doing and, you know, essentially starting all over to stand in line at an open mic that's lottery based so you could show up every week for three months and never get on. And you're in line with people who have been on late night. Right. <laughs> in the same line. Yeah. And you're like, this guy already has credits. What 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 the fuck am I doing? Yeah. yeah. Like it, no, it, I, it's so, we ended up in a different world. We ended up in uh New Jersey for a little bit. Sorry to jump on you. We ended no, up fine. in uh New Jersey for a little bit, just right across the, the river. And I would go in to Manhattan and this wasn't like I wasn't at the beginning of my career at all I'd go into the city I had you know I had been working Zanies for a while I've been working all these other clubs I got all these references and I'm standing out on the sidewalk at four o'clock in the fucking afternoon barking trying to get people in so that I can get a minute for every person that I bring yeah. into the club for a six o'clock show you know like like I was like man this is crap this is super hard you know it's, it's, it's it, it's no wonder that the people that make it out of like a specifically New York are super talented. Cause I mean, the amount of work that they are putting into trying you have to, to do I that mean, is people insane. Don't, I think people that um, just aren't familiar with the business of comedy, there's a lot of misconceptions and stuff. And uh, I mean, I think most people would admit it's harder than they think it is. Um, just the onstage aspect of it. But I mean, for one, the, 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 the lifestyle of a comic, you know, traveling and doing all the mics they should be doing to get better is not conducive to a relationship. It's not. Nope. I mean, you're, you're better off at least in the beginning. Not, I mean, to, to do it with a wife, let alone, you know, having children and, and, you know, e even just family. I mean, it's, it, it's a different, it's, to, to be honest, you, you have to be selfish. Yeah. Oh yeah. You have to, yeah. a lot of it, you, you have to just be like, it's, and, and especially now, which I think my wife gets frustrated with the social media aspect of it. It's so much of it is just me, 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 because you're promoting shows and you're promoting right. the other things you're doing. And it's just constant, like, I'm sure I don't even notice it because I'm a comic and most of the people in my feeds are comics. But like, if I wasn't a comic, I'd be like, Jesus, all these people do is talk about themselves. <laughs> and right. themselves. Like it, but that's, you have to, right? or you'll just get oh, yeah. left behind and nobody will pay attention. So it's, but yeah, yeah to, to move to one of the coasts, man, you're starting all over and it takes so long just to be able to do the good mics, let alone get on, you know, actual shows. And then you, you don't make money in New York city really, or in LA for that matter. Even those guys that have the credits, they're making their money on the road in the Midwest and in other places right. in the country. And then on top of that, you know, even the people with credits are struggling. Like, it's not like when you used to do Carson and you were essentially famous overnight, like, there's people that have been on Conan half a dozen times and nobody knows who they are. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, it's just changed so much and, and things don't hold the same amount of weight. And I would still give up one of my testicles that have a late night credit. Yeah. It's just, it's not, you know what I'm saying? It's just not this, what it used to be. Yeah. It's, it's so different. Like, uh, uh, one of the people that I point to a lot, uh, um, we're, we're, we're friends. We, we keep in touch a little bit. I'm not trying to name drop by any means, but uh, I'm sure you've heard of Pat McGann. I think he actually, uh, he's done Laugh Fest several times. Of uh, course. Um, Pat McGann is hilarious. He has been on, uh, he was on Letterman twice right at yep. the end, uh, which kind of sucks 
it, it, it's good that he was on Letterman, but it was also at the end of Letterman. So now it's like, you know, it's like that credit. It's still a good credit, but right. it becomes tougher because Letterman's gone. But he, he was Not on Letterman at least. Same, yeah. Right. He was on Letterman at least twice, I think maybe three times. He was the opener for uh, Sebastian forever. Oh, yeah. he was, he's doing he's doing sold out shows at Madison Square Garden. He's doing 20 minutes in front of Sebastian at Madison Square Garden. He just filmed the special. And, and I'm like, oh, dude, you guys are, people ask me, like, who's really funny? I'm like, oh, Pat McGain. And they're like, I don't know who that is. It's so, so crazy. But I mean, to me. you, you know, and I, McGann's, you know, he's one of the guys that I would always make a point to go see. For whatever reason, you know, him and Bozeman are always headlining their own weekends. But one yeah. weekend they were together for some reason. I think they did, like, <laughs> Grins did something weird where they had, like, four separate headliners and they all could, like, hang out, which was cool. But I follow him on social media. I've always really uh, thought Pat was funny. But you're right. I mean, there's guys who, who I – Bozeman definitely fits into that category. Oh, too. he how is he, not, how is he not famous? I know, right? Like, I know, right? Or even, like, a guy like Chad Daniels who everybody yeah. loves. Like, if you ask the average person who Chad Daniels is, they don't know who the fuck he is. Nope. It, and, nope. and that's not even, you know, that's not even necessarily my goal or what I think your goal should be is to, for people to know who you are to be, you know, in order to be a household name, you, you basically have to be on a sitcom because so many people right. are just out of the loop and they don't know. But, yeah. um, you know, just to get into clubs, even you think about a club books 52 weeks a year. Um, there's a lot more than 52 comics with credits. Yeah. So you, you oh, got to yeah. have more than just a late night. You got a Netflix special or a popular podcast. There's, I mean, it's becoming harder and harder to stand out and to, to be, you know, one of the, one of the top comics. So it's, it's increasingly it's, more difficult. And I don't know that this pandemic is going to heart or help live comedy in any way. That's for sure. It's already too easy to just pull up your phone and watch whatever you want to watch. Yeah. So speaking of being one of the top comics and what it takes, uh, that's a good segue here for me. Uh, what does it take to be the number one draft pick in the Deggy draft? And what <laughs> is the Deggy draft for people uh, well, that are listening that aren't sure? To, so here, here's how that ridiculousness started. It, it, as a Detroit Lions fan, you can, you can uh, relate. Um, the draft – is always a big deal, but you'd almost watch it to see how they were going to fuck it up uh, more than more than to see who they draft for hope. And right. um, so I would watch it, but it, it was just kind of in the background and I didn't pay too much of attention. And maybe like eight years ago, I started on Facebook. I would just say like uh, with the first pick in the 2000 whatever NFL draft, the New York Jets select, and then I would say one of my friends and I tag him, and I you know I'd say where he went to school, I'd find out where he went to school, I'd say what position he played, and then I would have like a bunch of fake quotes from like some of the analysts like Mal, Mal Kiper Jr., yeah. Todd McShay, and all these like <laughs> former athletes and celebrities, and just as a joke. And then I started kind of doing that more every year. It was just Facebook posts. Um, but it got to the point where I'd run into comics mostly. Uh, and they'd be like, "How? why didn't I get drafted? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they'd be like, you know, the thing you do on Facebook. I'm like, oh, God. So then I, I kind of made it into a thing where I called it the Deggy Draft. And then I would do that. Uh, it was still just Facebook posts. But then it turned into like a group that's it's almost 500 people now and then that, that turned into a page and and i started to make shirts you know the daggy draft shirt so if you got drafted you got a shirt or you could buy a shirt and then uh i started getting like local businesses to sponsor it so i would advertise their business via social media and then they'd give me things to give to like the top 10 or 20 picks um and the way you get drafted or picked is legitimately you just have to be an idiot really you it's 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 basically essentially a video like a video submission contest where whoever makes the most ridiculous videos um sometimes it is uh quantity over quality if somebody makes more than another uh, potential draftee i'll consider them 
uh, before somebody who didn't make any. Um, and it's it's just turned into this thing where people are trying to be the number one pick. So everybody's trying to top one another. And some of it is like sports related, like, hey, watch me kick this football or throw this ball through a hoop. But most of it has nothing to do with sports at all. And I, I think the, that uh, the misconception is people that aren't fans of sports or the NFL specifically are like, what is this kind of annoying? I don't even like sports. But most of the yeah. people in there <laughs> – um, and women and men didn't play sports in high school, let alone college, couldn't care less about sports, but it's, it's more just another outlet to like make content and be ridiculous and talk trash and be silly. Um, and it, it's, it's just become this thing where a ton of people are involved every year and it's, it's kind of grown bigger and bigger. And I think that my idea in the beginning was that somebody like a Barstool Sports or like a sports related uh, media company would like get their hands in it in some capacity and then it would it would go from there and then I could you know offer bigger prizes and have you know countrywide involvement yeah. rather than just like three or four states of, of people so yeah because I think I remember the first I think the first time that I was drawn to it is you know I'm scrolling through my feed one time and I, I'm not 100% sure, but I want to say, I think it was Matt Laria had posted, like, yeah, he was talking mad shit about yeah. like some <laughs> random comic. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah, and it's just so, the rabbit I mean, hole if, from there. If you're not in the loop, you, it's probably like, <laughs> why are these comics all just talking shit about each other? But it's, yeah, it, it is mostly ridiculous. And it, yeah. it's basically just something that coincides with the NFL draft every year. So like, for example, the Bengals drafted number one. So if you're drafted number one, the Dougie draft, you're going to the Bengals. And uh, I, I could probably also technically get sued by the NFL, <laughs> <laughs> but I I'm too, too small fry at this point for them to even notice. So, but I mean, they could even, they have contests for like the best fans and stuff. I mean, that's the yeah. real the real dream is to have them the actual NFL involved in some capacity, but there's probably too much uh, stuff that's not family friendly and <laughs> too profane. But um, yeah, you have also, to. I I think to get a better understanding, you'd have to check out the group or the the page on Facebook and really see what people are doing. <laughs> it's it's really it. it since people have a little bit more time than they normally do right now, it is yeah. worth the, the view to go and look and watch some of those. Uh, stay, staying with sports, uh, I did, and since you brought up Kevin Bozeman, I'll ask you this, I, since you're a fan. Did you follow his top 25 NBA players of all time? I looked at it, but I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell you who was second. I, yeah. Clearly Jordan was number one. But I can't yeah. remember exactly who he was. It controversial? Were there people upset about it? There were some people because I think he had LeBron as three or four. Okay. Um, what, the old timers weren't, weren't, weren't into it. Were huh? they, they wanted him to right. be number two? They wanted him to be number two because I think, if I remember correctly, his number two was Kareem or Magic. But he had, like, in his top five, in his top ten, he had a lot of those old-school players that a lot of people forget about. You know, Oscar, Wilt, Will. uh, <laughs> you know, it's, Kareem, Magic, like, a lot of those old-school people. And the amount of detail that he knew and put into and links to videos of different That's games awesome. I'll have to – I'll check that out tonight even because that sounds like something I'd be super into. And the NBA, if I – as far as the, you know, the, the four major sports, I'm a basketball guy first. So yeah. I, I think I'd be super into that. Yeah, yeah I think you'd enjoy it. Um, so speaking of basketball with the last dance, I, uh, we were talking before we started recording that uh, you actually didn't become a Pistons fan until like late 90s. No, uh, it was like, I think it was, it was like when that you, do you remember the turquoise? Oh yeah, Zara, when their <laughs> yeah. jerseys changed for a while. Yeah, they were um, bad. <laughs> yeah, it was a desperate attempt to be like, well, we'll change your jerseys. Maybe it'll be better then. Right. Um, I think it was like the end of Grant Hill, maybe before he got traded to the Magic. 
So maybe my years are off. But obviously the Bulls were out of the picture. Jordan was retired again. This was even before I think he came back to the Wizards. But yeah. um, it, was, it was at least three or four years before they had – they started to have their run and then they won the championship in 04, obviously. And that's right. probably my favorite team of all time is like the Chauncey Billups, Ben Wallace, Pistons. Um, but yeah, I grew up as a kid, man. I was, I was a Bulls guy. I mean, I'm I'm sure there was a ton of white kids who lived in the suburbs who were huge Jordan and Bulls fans, which was very bandwagon on me, but like, I didn't know any better, you know? And I was, I was too young to be a like bad boys guy. So I, I, I didn't understand why people hated the Bulls. Um, but looking back, you know, I love the bad boy Pistons now. But yeah, I didn't I like jump on now, the Pistons till later. Yeah, I, I've always been kind of a mixed bag because growing up in Oklahoma, but being like a Lions fan and mm-hmm. a Red Wings fan. Uh, but I was lucky enough that, you know, we had WGN and I had friends who had WGN. Right. So I grew up a diehard Cubs fan. You can see all the Cubs crap I have back here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I grew up a diehard Cubs fan. And then also at the time, because of the WGN, had the Bulls on a lot too. So it was kind of a Bulls fan, but I enjoyed watching the Pistons. I was talking with Joe about this last night. I'd like to get your thoughts on it too. I think one of the main things I actually took away from that documentary, I miss that style of basketball. Oh, yeah. The the style of basketball now is good. I enjoy it. But, you know, like when – Well, the numbers are are, – The numbers are just inflated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the average – Teams average like 115, 120 points. Yeah, it's crazy. When you look at – when you're watching that documentary, I kept hearing people say, like – they only scored 82 points in a win. Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, they played defense back then. That one – I totally <laughs> forgot that the one the one finals game, the Jazz scored 56. It was like the lowest point total points. in yeah. history, not just the playoffs. But, right. yeah, all those scores you saw, they were like high 80s, low 90s. Yeah. And it was like that in the Pistons go to the go-to-work – or hard work Pistons, whatever you want to call them, the Chauncey Billup, Riff Hamilton. Yeah. That era was still even, that was like the very end of real defense and before it was just all analytics and three pointers. Yeah. And then everything kind of changed, but I do miss because it, it, and it also seemed like there wasn't as much camaraderie league wide, which I liked. True. All yeah. these, I all like these that. players are like hanging out in the off season now. And it, it makes me feel like an old man saying it, but like, you yeah. didn't see teams that just battle in the playoffs going to Mexico on jet skis together. No. That shit wasn't <laughs> happening. They hated each other. Hated it was like a other. rivalry. I, I feel like they're, you know, and I, I'm not saying they don't care as much anymore. I mean, they, they certainly leave it out on the court still and, and they still want it. But yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it was I love, personal then. It was personal then. And I think – one of my favorite mo- moments from the doc too was when Jordan was filming Space Jam. Yeah. And everybody was kind of, dude, like, that's what I want to see. Like, yeah. no foul, you know, like, call your own foul, like, that kind of stuff. Like, I think the NBA today would be better if they brought back, if they got rid of one simple rule chain. And to me, bring back the hand check. I think yeah. if you bring that hand check back, it, will slow the game down some and it will 100%. make it a lot better than what it is now. Cause just that one simple little tweak, I think would make a, a huge difference and probably lower the, lower it by 10, 12 points a game. I bet the average score would come down and it'd slow that game down a little bit more. Yeah. Which... Make each point mean more. And, you know, I, I'm sure the leagues, you know, their theory, it's probably not even a theory. I mean, it's probably true. I guess at this point they've, I mean, points mean ticket sales, I guess. I, I guess it's more exciting, more fast-paced. But, I mean, as an NBA fan myself, I would, I would like to see it go back to, to, to being, you know, more physical and just – it seems too easy to score an hour. Right. I mean, you, yeah. you, it's, it's, the errors are so different, too. There's guys that were in the NBA then that wouldn't be in the NBA now because they can't shoot a three pointer and you have to be able to right. shoot from outside at all five positions now. And they're, they're yeah. like the, the, like the old school big man 
like Andre Drummond might be one of the last guys who's just like rebounds and putbacks and doesn't really have an offensive game or a jump shot. But that kind of player is just being like erased. Right. Basically. Well, I mean, it, it's a mixed bag though. Cause like, I think if you were to go back to that style or you bring back the hand check players like Kawhi, LeBron, but that bigger style, faster player would still be successful. Oh, they'd be. Those guys would be dominant in any era. But you might lose Steph Curry. Steph Curry yeah. might not be able to make it from that because if 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 Kawhi or LeBron um, has to run through a hand check, somebody grabbing at him, they're gonna make that right. Steph Curry isn't. He's too small. But he's now a little he guy. I mean. Not- I think with picks and like, you know, pick and rolls and certain offenses, he could still get off enough shots. And I mean, they just shoot more. They, they there was guys, time. they just didn't even think about shooting threes. I mean, when, you know, the famous game when Jordan does the shoulder shrug against the Blazers because he hit six threes. Like, I mean, somebody hits six threes and a half now, it's like, ah, yeah, that's a good right. game. But, and yeah. Jordan wasn't a three point shooter, so it was even more like a surprise, I guess. But it, it's just, they, they were showing uh, statistics as far as, like, the whole NBA, like, each team, how many threes they shoot compared to, like, that era. And it's – I mean, it's so crazy. That's, yeah, I think – But I you're think right. Somebody, Steph wouldn't be the same. Yeah, Steph wouldn't be the same. I think someone that would thrive in that uh, – system if they were to get rid of that and change it a little bit would be Damian Lillard. I'm a big fan of – Oh, I uh, love Dame Lillard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like him a lot. I think he would – he would be good from that. So, I don't know, man. Basketball's great, but I will always be, you know, speaking of physicality, do you miss the fighting in hockey? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's certainly, you know, I still remember the Wings Avalanche fight. Oh, best with fight Patrick of all time. And, oh. um, that, yeah, that's one of my – my my favorite memories of of uh, Detroit sports. Speaking of that fight, sorry to hop in, but speaking of that fight, I was so pissed off at the NFL that they missed the perfect opportunity that they didn't have the Red Wings and the Avs playing March 26, 19 or uh, 2016. Like it was 20 years later. Yeah. Like that would have been the perfect day to schedule that game, but you know they yeah, I'm like oh, they totally. Awesome. It totally but yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly made things different. I mean, yeah, it, I, it was like a sport within a sport almost. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, like, you know, Darren McCarty was barely viable <laughs> during his time. Well, right. There's <laughs> got to be a part of those guys who were just there to be enforcers, right, that are not in the league anymore? Yeah, tons of them. Tons of them, you know, and I hate, look, I, people give me a hard time all the time. I can't stand Sidney Crosby, dude. I think he's the most overrated player in the world. <laughs> I've heard I, that before too. You know, um, my favorite player in the league right now is probably actually Ovechkin mm-hmm. uh, because he's aggressive. He'll take a hit. He'll give a hit. Um, you know, he's old. He's, he reminds me of like, if, uh, if Chelios could play offense. <laughs> right. <laughs> what Ovechkin reminds me of. But <laughs> um, yeah, they, well, I so okay. good, but so but so the, the overall uh idea is that Crosby is just too soft, huh? I don't know that I don't know that it's there, that he he was just the golden child from the beginning and kind of well, he was the golden child right. from the beginning and I don't know that it's that he's too soft. But I don't think that he's allowed to play rough. Like if anybody right. hits him, they're called. And I will admit that it's probably not all his fault mm-hmm. <laughs> by any means. You know, right. take advantage of what you've been given. But people look at him wrong, and and they're going to the box, and that's the kind of shit that annoys me about him. You know, like I miss the old. You know, everyone took a hit and uh could play and everyone was ready to fight at any time like i miss that kind of style um you know but 
hockey, I think the problems that they have are self-inflicted. Like they expanded too fast. They way watered down the pool. So hockey's had some issues that were totally self-inflicted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. you know, when you talk about all these leagues reducing physicality and especially now with the, the CTE stuff so prevalent, uh, I mean, it's always been prevalent, but we just are paying right. attention to it now. It just makes you wonder, like, how much longer do you think the NFL has? That's true. Yeah. I think, you, college, I think it's college. I think it's college. You're going to see. I don't know no. that it'll ever completely go away, but I don't know. Part of me feels like, too, that I mean, it's just such a big, such a big business. You'd think that they'd go to, like, flag football, like a flag football or something just a lot less physical before it just went away. But I don't know. That would take away. I don't know. I, I compare it to what's happening with CTE in football now to what happened with baseball and steroids. Yeah. Which I'm really looking forward to this documentary they got coming up on ESPN with uh, Sammy Sosa and McGuire. But overall, like the, I look at CTE and steroids the same way in baseball. It sucks. I wish it didn't exist. And I wish there were a way to make it go away and not have to deal with it. However, everybody playing that sport and doing that knows the risk. Yeah. And if someone wants to make millions of dollars to entertain me, I will let them. Right. I don't know what that says about me as a person, but if we're being honest, like if this dude is, you know, wants to make, the, the sad thing is, is not everybody makes millions of dollars and, in any sport, right? Like the majority oh. of athletes aren't set for life. You know, part well, of that and is- And their windows are small, but I mean, whether they play a year or 10, I mean, you're right. They signed up and they know the risks and- Yeah, it's I mean, it's tough. I think there's probably parents, a lot of parents that just aren't allowing their kids to play football now. But yeah. like at a certain point, the kids are just gonna be like, well, I'm, I wanna play. Right. Um, so I, you're I gonna know. see you're gonna see more and more kids getting into it later in life, mm -hmm. and maybe in some way that can help with CT and all this stuff going on. If maybe if maybe if I don't know, I, I, I say this as my wife is actually a neuropsychologist, and she's probably gonna yell at me for saying stupid <laughs> shit. <laughs> but but maybe if they start getting hit in the head later in life, it makes a difference, right? Like I don't yeah. know. But once their brain maybe, is fully developed and right. So um well, hey, uh before we move on to the uh to the ambush thing here, just real quick, uh it's been great talking with you. Uh one thing I wanted to ask you in case there was anything you wanted to get out. I know that um uh, I, I know not everybody knows this, but you you have skin cancer and you've been going through all your treatments and yeah. everything for it. Um I just kinda wanted to give you the the floor for a little bit and and if there's websites that people can check out or if yeah. there's anything that people can do, whether it be with money or with just uh, awareness or anything like that. Uh, just give you a couple of minutes to, to say what well, you'd like to say. Um, if you'd like to, I, I, I'll just, uh, I can just give you my Venmo and people can just send me money. Yeah, that works. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, well, I think uh, what, what's important to me is that people are just uh, more informed as far as uh, skin cancer, the differences, you know, between, you know, melanoma and some other skin cancers and just misconceptions about uh, things that, you know, could lead to skin cancer and uh, things you should get checked out. Um, this is actually May is uh, Melanoma Awareness Month. and um, the where I where I found out I had melanoma was on my back and it was actually a mole that I had since I was a kid. And now I, I think oh, wow. some people think that melanoma just always just shows up, you know, on your skin like a new mole that shows up out of nowhere that you had hadn't seen before and out of the blue and then you go get it looked at and you find out it's melanoma. 
but like I said, this was something I had since I was a kid, and I think I procrastinated to have it looked at because I just was like, oh, that's always been there. What I'm not worried about it, but right. over time it changed. I uh, got bigger and darker and, and kind of weirder looking. So I went and got it looked at, found out that it was uh, melanoma, and then I found out it was in the lymph nodes, putting it in stage three. But fortunately, it hadn't gone uh, anywhere else in the body in an organ or anything. So stayed at stage three. Then I had a surgery to have it removed from my back, some skin around and underneath, and uh, a few surgeries to remove uh, basically all the lymph nodes under my left armpit just to ensure that it doesn't come back there. Um, and, uh, and now I do the treatments every three weeks, but I, I don't have to do um, chemo or radiation. It's a treatment called immunotherapy where it just uh, it basically strengthens your immune system. And I couldn't tell you exactly what it does to prevent cancer from coming back. Um, but uh, it is different from chemo. The, the side effects aren't nearly as bad and it's not as rough on your body. But I think it is only available for or melanoma, the immunotherapy. But um, wow. basically, uh, just wear sunblock. If you're if you're a whitey like myself, it's important to uh, put the sunblock on. Exposure to the sun is what causes most melanoma. Okay. Ultraviolet rays uh, aren't good for you if if you get a lot of exposure to them. So wear the sunblock, and if there's something on your skin that looks weird, um, whether it's a mole or, or a dark spot. I would get an appointment with a dermatologist immediately. The sooner you have it looked at, the better. Um, some of the signs of melanoma, if, if, it's, if it's dark in color and not a lighter mole, that could be bad. Um, and you'll notice if a mole isn't symmetrical, like if it's different on one side than it is the other, that's probably also a bad sign. So those are okay. two big things. Um, and yeah, just, just get anything that looks weird or you're concerned about, or even maybe if you're not concerned with it and you're just not sure, go have it looked at because the sooner the better. And if you want to, uh, because it's Melanoma Awareness Month, you could donate to the Skin Cancer Foundation. Uh, their, their website is pretty easy to find and you can uh, donate through that. Or I, I've actually got a link through an event on Facebook right now because my wife and I are going to do a, uh, basically a social distance 5k i don't know when this is going to come out uh probably a couple of weeks okay what are you doing we when you go over that but so don't worry about that part but basically we're just doing a 5k uh with some not with anybody but uh we're yeah. having people do a 5k to basically uh you know post pictures with the hashtag uh get out and move for melanoma and it's just to spread awareness of melanoma okay. but i just told you uh what to be aware of so i just nice. know that it's nothing to mess with melanoma is not uh it's not pretty it, it can spread elsewhere in the body and pretty quickly and become real ugly real quick so it's it's definitely something that more people should take seriously and i think it's the uh it's the one of the least researched cancers and one that isn't talked about as much um but sh probably should be so Wow. Well, thanks for uh, saying something about it as, uh, you know, we yeah, try man. to do this and uh, br bring the vibe down a little bit before we... Nah, that's, what, that's what I go for. Uh, now I'd actually like to talk about my dead dad for like 15 minutes so I can do that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, man. It's, uh, I'm trying to make you know, do cancer jokes on stage. I try to make it funny. It's, it's tough to make cancer funny, you know, what, what do you want? It's, yeah, it's tough to make cancer funny. I, I, I've had several uh, close friends, unfortunately, that I've lost to cancer, uh, com comedians. Um, and I, I hate when anybody gets cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. But when a comedian gets it, it's at least can be made into an entertaining, you know, like. It, right. it, I absolutely <laughs> use stand up as like therapy. And I, I've talked about it on stage. It's uh, it's uh, for me, I had to, you know. And I, yeah, some of the stuff, I, you know, it needs work, but uh, I'll get there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I, I appreciate you talking about it and letting people know because it is important. I mean, it's something, mm -hmm. you know, like I know everybody's all worried about coronavirus and everything now and fucking rightfully so. <laughs> but right, there's but other there's, shit there's that you got to take. to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, um, 
Uh, before we go, we're going to do this little last segment here called the ambush. We've got a couple of topics in here. Let's I don't do know it. What they are. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, the first one uh, is slime. Oh boy, slime. Um, yeah, I hate that shit, man. I have tried. I have gotten that stuff out of my carpet. My, <laughs> it has ruined rugs. It has ruined tables and chairs and. Oh man, did, did you ever play with slime growing up? Or oh yeah, well I had I don't know if I ever had slime. I'm what I had was Gak. Do you remember Gak? I do remember Gak. Yeah, that was like I think inspired by Nickelodeon because that yep. maybe it's from the Double Dare show where they dumped all that green crap on the contestants. But slime, so be, slime was like uh, thinner then. Yeah, slime is thinner now. They've got all kinds of different slimes and. Like they have glitter slime and then they have like dry slime and they have wet slime and they've got uh, like it's crazy. And my girls make it all the time. So, like, it, it's <laughs> it with sounds like, like a pain shit. in the ass, is what it sounds like. Dude, it's a pain in the ass. And you know what makes this shit? It's crazy. It's like um, tide detergent. Of uh, course. These kids in this tide. I know, right? It's the tide challenge. Uh, or your wrestler. What was your wrestler's character's name? Oh, the, um, the Tide God. Tide God. Uh, but yeah, to, <laughs> to make it, it's like Tide and then like the old Barbasol foaming shaving cream. Oh, my and God. Believe it or, and then believe it or not, like one of the ingredients is uh, the uh, eye drop solution that you like put your contacts and shit in. Like, Who's it's, figuring it's like this stuff out? I know, Who's right? just like concocting a bunch of shit, putting it together to hopefully <laughs> hoping to make new slime you know what by lit by thinking of those three ingredients that i just came up with i'm gonna go with johnson and johnson like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how can we get somebody to now there's money in slime man kids it's uh <laughs> yeah it's the 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 texture of it alone just just sounds unpleasant uh, I'm, or weird. I'm a little i'm a little older than you uh I didn't have any slime growing up, but I had Silly Putty. Dude. Silly oh, putty. I remember Silly Putty, though. Came in the little egg. Yeah, man. That Silly Putty was awesome. All right, let's see what else we got here. Ooh, good one. Sleeping. Ooh, boy. <laughs> That's a... I, I can go, like, three, four days in a row with between four, six hours of sleep before I'm done. Yeah. What, do you have, do you have a clock like that? Like, you know, um, like on the you know, third day? I, I feel like I did when I was working and on the road. I mean, now in quarantine, I've, I've been able to, to sleep more fortunately, cause I don't need to be up for anything. I mean, it basically comes down to, you know, uh, I get up out of fear of my wife strangling mm -hmm. me because she's <laughs> been up for hours doing things and being right. productive and I'm snoring. Um, but no, I mean, especially if I'm drinking caffeine, man, I could, I, I, I can definitely say most of my life, I haven't got as much sleep as I should. Um, but I'll also say that that's always been an underrated part of uh, being homeless to me. People never talk about the benefits of being homeless. Like, no, I guess <laughs> no, you don't have to ever be up. No. Uh, you can just keep sleeping. I mean, you're probably yeah. drunk and you're on a bench or under a freeway, but you don't but have to sleeping. ever be awake for anything. <laughs> hey, you're just asleep. Yeah, but you don't have, yeah, that's the hard thing now. Like, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you with my wife. So, uh, uh, my, my brilliant wife, I got to give her as many bouquets as I can. She's actually writing a book right now. And uh, she, yeah, she, yeah, you got a lot like, of pressure then, dude. I have so much. My wife and I have a uh, a um, a bet to see who can get on the Daily Show first. Me as a comedian, or her as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I am, oh, man. I am lagging. I am lagging behind right now. <laughs> well, so, I'm just happy to hear that you don't have a contest to see who can get on, like Bill O'Reilly or one of those shows first. <laughs> At least it's the daily exactly. show. Right. Now, I, hey, you know what? 
if Tucker Carlson, Carlson calls. Uh, oh, of course. I'm <laughs> Listen, whether or not I agree with everything those guys say, if they want me on the show, yeah, I'll do it. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. No, but she, because she's writing that book, she's up against her deadline, but she's getting up at five o'clock in the morning to write because like everybody's asleep, right? So I'll get up at like eight o'clock and the coffee pot's already turned off and cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, well, and I don't think, you know, my wife, she, when she goes to the office, she'll go around eight, but she'll get up a lot of mornings. For like two years, she she went to her bar class. I don't know if you're familiar with bar, but it's it's these different workouts um, yeah. that deal with a lot of uh, you know flexibility and like core muscles that you don't usually use. And anyway, she'd go to that, then she'd go to work, and I'd wake up around like nine or so, go to my day job. But the the sleeping schedule of a comedian is very much the opposite of a nine to five. So she goes to sleep. She's she's an early sleepers so she'll she'll be in bed by like nine o'clock and sometimes i wouldn't get home from a show till midnight or one right so clearly i'm not gonna be waking up at the same time as you do you know yeah no it's the same but, yeah but my, my wife's an early less. yeah my wife's an early sleeper too she's usually in bed by eight she's in bed by eight eight thirty asleep by nine nine thirty but she's getting up at five o'clock in the morning like right so, so of course she's ready to go to it sleep. makes sense yeah all right we got one more here Toys. Yes. Uh, did you have a favorite toy growing up? I did. I, I, well, I think it's a tie between Legos and GI Joes. And I can, if I'm completely honest, man, if you if you gave me Legos right now, I would for sure play with them or assemble them. I don't know that I'd still play with GI Joes. I feel like if my wife yeah. walked in on me like assembling Legos, I feel like I could talk myself out of that. But if she walked in on me <laughs> playing with GI Joes, <laughs> I don't know that I could explain myself no. enough for no. her to never stop making me feel like an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I, it's so funny to bring up Legos. One of my really good friends uh, on quarantine has picked up Legos. That's his thing. He's quarantined by himself. He's not married. He's, he's got a dog. That's it. And so he's picked up Legos and he's doing like all these intricate things. And like, I'll call him at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then he'll get back to me at like one. He's like, yeah, sorry, dude. I was up until seven doing Lego. You know, like, but what else do you have to do? It's insane, man. Do yourself a favor <laughs> in all this time you have. Just YouTube like Lego collectors or like Lego competitions. It, there's people who dedicate. It's insane their life and every set they've made to like their whole basement has like shelving with individual containers. They separate them like by color mm -hmm. or each individual piece, just thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. on these Legos. And what I didn't realize is that I thought you just bought the set and then you made whatever the set was, but you can buy just whatever Legos you want. And essentially, I mean, you could do, you can make whatever you wanted. You could make, you could make a Lego version of your actual house. Yeah, there's a, a good show. I think what got him into it, I watched it with him once before the quarantine started, is uh, there was Lego Masters that had... Uh, oh, yeah. W Will Arnett was the host. Uh, but it, his birthday was about a month ago. So for his birthday, he's a diehard Packers fan. So I got him a Green Bay Packers cleat that you have to put together, a Lego cleat. Nice. And so he texted me like a week later, and he was like, hey, man, this cleat's no joke. And I'm like, dude, it's 82 pieces. And he was like... <laughs> No, it's 827 <laughs> pieces. I was like, oh, I read that wrong. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty big difference. I was like, my bad, dude. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think Legos are one of the toys that are acceptable for grown men to play with. I would agree. I, I have gotten into, my, my stepdad had, uh, and now I've gotten into it because of John Oliver. Uh, I don't know if you watched last week tonight, but he... He is yeah. sponsoring the marble marble races uh, okay. because they needed a sponsor and they were going to go under. So he sponsored them so they didn't go under. But my stepdad had one of those, and, and this is, and I don't mean like when I was a kid. I mean, this is like maybe 10 years ago. If okay. that turned my parents' dining room table into just a marble set where like you build all the thing and the marble goes down and around and 
like took over my mom's like nice glass dining room table. And That's awesome. would go and just for hours play with the marbles and get everything together. That was probably I'm waiting for recently. that stage in my marriage where my wife lets me bogard the entire dining room <laughs> or just any area of the house other than, you know, the, yeah. the basement at times. But I don't think it's uh, going to be anytime soon. Not anytime soon. Well, Adam, thanks for uh, sitting down and talking with uh, with me for a while. It was great to uh, talk with you and get to know you a little better. Um, thanks for I having really me, appreciate man. You. Uh, um, we'll get all your uh, your stuff, you know, put along the bottom and the scroll and whatnot. But you got any websites? Anything? Uh, Perfect. Wanna, yeah, man. Um, my website is just adam uh, daggycom uh, You can find me. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I have, I've got a fan page on there. It's Adam Deggy, last name's D-E-G-I. If you put that into any social media, it'll come up. Nobody else has the same name. So follow me, yeah. please. This is all I have. <laughs> That's what he needs. Uh, we'll throw his Venmo up there too. just in case. Yeah, please. <laughs> all right, Adam. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks for having me. Yep, you got it.